Welcome to Classes in Session presented by UI Health. I'm Doug Glanville. Artificial intelligence has been around ever since the dawn of computing. We saw technology act as a facilitator and accelerator, quicker with quality information to help us make better decisions. In the competitive sports landscape, this is a burgeoning area that props up advantage. Well-synthesized data that helps train, strategize, and stay steps ahead of an opponent. Companies are spawning from everywhere in the space of the machine. They help with our curveball, the way to take a turn on the racetrack, the way to make the NFL safer. There is no arena where AI is not invited. Yet with any pervasive technology, there are questions, one of privacy, of accuracy, and in the end, the fundamental one about humanity. AI is here to stay. Will humanity evolve at the same pace? We ask these questions and more of our esteemed guests. Ari Kaplan, head of evangelism for Databricks, an AI and data company that works closely with organizations to help them access and harness their information. And Dr. Suraith Venkata Subramanian, professor of data and computer science at Brown University and director for the Center of Tech Responsibility. Let's get to class. When we run out of ways to express the sentiment that we want people, not robots, to be in the driver's seat, we say we want the, quote, human element. Every year that we say it, our society relies more and more on artificial intelligence. The human element and its value gets blurrier as if each year we need a stronger prescription to see our worth. That trend makes us feel the creep of dependency as it washes over us with every eye appointment. We will defend our need to elevate our human necessity in all of our creations, be it in sport or how we do our accounting. Yet this resolve only endures until a critical fourth quarter call is missed that we can see on the big screen shortly thereafter. Why would we not use all and any of the tools at our disposal to improve our processes, to avoid the bad calls, to ensure the good ones, or simply have the calls made for us? Sports are all about improvement, a relentless effort to find an edge. We want our separators to be laced in humanity, work ethic, training styles, consistency, or maybe we will even let in the divine for good measure and include God-given talent. Artificial intelligence has long been here, but it is reaching a fever pitch as every sport and its partners are simmering in it, racing for better tech, collecting information on everything that shapes an outcome. Forbes outlined in many areas of how AI hits the sports world. In the arms race that is AI, with players like Meta, Google, Microsoft, and a whole host of others at the starting block, caution has been somewhat suppressed given it's baked in that AI is always learning. There is no perfect timing to roll it out, so no need to nail down what is a constant and evolutionary process. This has allowed the market to open up as it accepts feedback even in unfinished forms, just as Steph Curry views his jump shot as an unfinished masterpiece. Still, there is little that will stop this industry that according to allied market research will be worth just under $20 billion at the end of the decade. AI will always generate the important yet circular debate about the line we do not wish to cross. Are humans replaced or just enhanced? There are choices to be made as to how direct we want this intelligence to play in our games. We are augmenting instead of replacing ourselves in the best case scenarios. But like with any revolution, there will be setbacks and consequences, unintended or not. Then over time, we are left to ponder, where did we start as humans and where does the machine end? Well, we have the perfect guest when we're talking about sports and artificial intelligence. Uh, we have the esteemed Ari Kaplan. And Ari, it's uh, incredible to hear your background as head evangelist at Databricks, which is a data and AI company, but you also have deep experience in baseball, uh, forming the Chicago Cubs analytics department, special assistant with the Baltimore Orioles. So uh, your, your insight will be very welcome today. So thanks for joining us. Doug, thank you so much for having me. Can't wait. So Ari, I mean, this world of AI is, is taking not only the world by storm, but sports. And uh, and you're at the heart of, you know, what we talk about, the foundational elements, the data. And uh, so I'm interested in understanding how quickly this is accelerated from, from your perspective. And I guess, what are the biggest changes you've seen? 
Yeah, it's an incredibly exciting time to be in sports and data and AI. The data itself is expanding exponentially. So across every sport, now they're taking both what you call structured data, which is traditional, and unstructured data like video. Yeah, and then the sports realm, you know, it, it seems like it has its own unique elements to data. Uh, it's often the differentiator uh, in, in success and failure and all the things that come with highly competitive environments. I mean, are there particular trends you're seeing in sports that stand out to the data world? Yeah, so uh, one trend uh, has been called what's called the lake house. And there's been traditional uh, like old school databases that would get you into the like billions of records, but now we need more. Uh, you need trillions of records of information. So this thing called the lake house is a, a newish environment where you can get insights from all of your data. So whether it's a scouting report, which is like text, whether it's biomechanical data recording from sensors or video cameras, you have the ability to merge it all together and get insights, uh, which really pick the best of all worlds. And then from that, you can make predictions. Uh, how does Doug Glanville, here's what we, he did the first couple of years, here's how it might project into the future years. And you're using both data and video, which is so key. Well, what's interesting is like with sports being in these hyper-competitive environments, but also the fact that they're kind of small subsets within these tight-knit communities that are working kind of off of similar data, right? We batting average and scouting reports. I want to understand more about something that Joe Madden mentioned on our podcast uh, a couple of years ago. He's like, well, if everybody has similar or the same kind of data, then how do you create differentiation. I absolutely. And love Joe Madden. And yeah, he poses a very interesting question. Uh, when I started out, I've been uh, fortunate enough to have been in the game many decades. Uh, There's only a handful of people doing these types of analytics. So you would have an advantage to have actionable insights that other teams wouldn't. Like if you could shift your defense and save uh, tens, tens of runs per year, win many more games per year, that's an advantage. But to his point, to your point, every team now has a staff of 5, 10, even 40 people in the data engineering, data science. People are generally collecting the same thing. So how do you get an advantage? And uh, number one, this goes to the, the human side. You're collecting the same mechanical information, but the scouts who actually watch players in high school in college, uh, internationally, the, the, this is information that is proprietary to each team. So where analytics is really helpful is looking at facts in the past and projecting forward. And then the humans, uh, where the, the advantage per the Joe Madden point is, um, if you have people who are better at forecasting forward from a human perspective, that gives you an advantage. We continue with our in-depth look at the effect AI is having on sports and examine what would happen if there are no guardrails in place to restrict its usage. Next on Classes in Session with Doug Glanville, presented by UI Health. Welcome back to Classes in Session with Doug Glanville, presented by UI Health, and our conversation with Ari Kaplan. And it speaks often to sometimes, you know, maybe the fears around, you know, what does this look like without certain guardrails? And I think what seems to be challenging is, you know, AI is learning, right? It's a, it's a constant evolution. And so where do you put guardrails into something that's you know, almost breathing in its own way? It, exactly. So guardrails, one of my favorite topics, it's kind of a theme called governance. And governance is, is two ways. One is it's to make sure people have the right access to the right data. So for example, if you're sharing data among leagues, there's certain medical information that you don't wanna share. So there's actual laws around governance, what you can and can't share. Um, but from the opportunity standpoint, governance is uh, showing transparency. You know, so one example is a scout couldn't like a player and then year after, over year, they tend to like the player more and more or less and less. So understanding who's providing the data is, is part of that whole governance. And that leads to transparency. How is your model created? Um, if you make a recommendation, you want the model to not just say, we think this player is going to provide this much 
every year for the next 10 years. But what are the five reasons we believe this player will do well or five reasons we believe the player won't do well? And that's all part of the governance, understanding, having that transparency. And that all leads to trust. So let's look, a, look ahead for a minute. I mean, I'm you know, curious where this goes. You know, what do you think is sort of that, that next frontier? Uh, there's a few things that maybe I can answer. One is I, uh, it's called data intelligence. And there is, you know, all the data in there, there's insights of how a pitcher throws a pitch, but there's really intelligence behind that. Some information, like right now, it's just 3D spatial data that teams are collecting. And they have a good idea of where the player's body moved. But what is not really a good idea is the like for each individual player what is a good maneuver or not so for example one pitcher may be good to have their fingers locked here another pitcher pedro martinez he has super long fingers uh he can grip the ball differently so it's really i i think that one of the next frontiers is to have individualized development plans to make uh what, what you call that data intelligence so that, that's one of the two main fr next frontiers. And then the other, Gen AI. People are probably familiar with large language models, which is one type of Gen AI. But a, a handful of teams, just a few of them I'm seeing, are, are really embracing that. And where that's important is uh, you have scouting reports, injury information, and like traditional data that's being kept. Gen AI, you can build a model based on your own scouting report information, based on your own like linguistics. If you do an LLM on your own data, uh, the language like running out of gas means one thing to the world, but in baseball, it means a baseball player is getting tired, probably a pitcher. So Gen AI, now teams are getting wise to create their own large language models. And this is accelerating faster than what most people realize. So. This is what we know now. A year from now, there's a lot of smart, creative people all over the world. Uh, it's going to be fascinating, you know, coming back a year from now and seeing what may happen. Oh, all right. I mean, that, that's fascinating. The language within the language and certainly in the baseball world. I want to really thank you for taking so much time to, to break this down for us uh, because it's so interesting and it's captured the imagination of all these sports fans. And just wanted to get greater understanding, and you provided that. Doug, thank you so much for having me on. It's been a pleasure. Well, in our discussion with the combination of sport and artificial intelligence, uh, it's always important to understand those that are in the forefront of the field. And today, we were fortunate to have a professor from Brown University uh, who's worked on the AI Bill of Rights as one uh, contribution he's made on the public level. Uh, but also his work in data science and computer science at Brown and working at the Center for Tech Responsibility makes him extremely uh, pertinent to this conversation. So Dr. Surath Venkata Subramanian, I appreciate you taking the time uh, to share your insights. Thanks for having me, Doug. Well, I want to jump in on sort of the basics here because um, just understanding what artificial intelligence really is and how it uh, is shaped by definition. So I guess, how would you define AI? Oh, that's a, that's a tricky thing because the definitions have keep shifting depending on who you ask. I think if I put on my hat as a professor teaching you know, computer science and teaching AI, I would say that broadly speaking, AI is the quest to make design computer systems that can do what people do or surpass what people do in a variety of settings, you know, whether it's reasoning, planning, learning, even now being creative, maybe. Well, I mean, one of the aspects of, of AI that's coming to the forefront is in this realm of sports. And, you know, you've worked a lot around framing or guardrails, even around public policy with respect to AI. But what are the unique challenges when you're sort of entering this private sector? You know, sports has different incentives, so to speak, than, say, the public domain. I've been thinking a little bit about this question of AI and sports. And one thing that comes to mind, which I think touches on a lot of themes that are currently sources of tension right now in the creative world, is when I think of name image likeness issues. Right. I know that for, you know things like Madden, NFL, and other sort of and the NBA 2K, right? You beep, they do all this motion tracking of athletes to get their best sort of model of how athletes look and how they 
function on the court. And so I begin to think, you know, one of the things that AI potentially can do is be able to generate, you know, you know, seemingly authentic or fairly authentic facsimiles of athletes, even without access to the athletes themselves. And then the question is, you know, if you as an athlete, you know, are marketing your own image and your own likeness and getting remunerated for it, will that continue to be the case as AI gets used more and more in these settings? It's definitely an issue that's going to come up. Well, that brings me to my next question around uh, the AI Bill of Rights. You know, you work closely to co-author this document in consultation with the federal government. And often you think of Bill of Rights and you think of policy and governance. And where that handoff hits sports is often collective bargaining, you know, your ability to negotiate these things into policy. Uh, what, what do you think from that Bill of Rights experience do you think athletes should even consider bringing to the table uh, with respect to what they should protect against? So this is another very good question. A lot, of, I mean, again, a lot of our thinking around the protections that people should have involve protections where people's rights opportunities for advancement and access to services are being limited in some way or restricted in some way by AI, right? So when I think of, I guess, the thing that cl most closely resonates in the sports world is opportunities for advancement and how, you know, you're able to succeed in your chosen career and how you as a worker are treated. One of the big issues that, for example, comes up with the use of AI is worker surveillance and worker monitoring. So the, from the point of view as athletes, as workers in an industry, I think that is a, is potentially a concern. I will say that I, uh, you know, since sports is all about performance, and you know, any monitoring you can do to improve performance is probably going to be a good thing. I don't know how that plays out in in, in the world that of, of professional athletes. Coming up, how will artificial intelligence affect and change the future of sports? We discuss next on classes in session with Doug Glambo, presented by UI Health. Welcome back to Classes in Session with Doug Glanville, presented by UI Health, and our conversation with Dr. Suraith Venkata Subramanian. How challenged is that consciousness, at least getting elevated, when you're in ecosystems that are designed to be sort of small and elite, right? You're talking about sports, right? There's 30 major league teams, and they're all talking to each other, uh, creating data and trying to differentiate between like microscopic uh, differences. Uh, but yet, those communities tend to set the tone for public policy. I guess how you know. So how challenging when you're in a sports world and you're looking for different advantages? Uh, do you almost like how important is it to keep those guardrails sometimes around communities that have that sort of illusion uh, of sort of like public interest when they're actually in this private private space? I think every community, no matter how elite, will find a moment when their concerns, the concerns they realize that they have to worry about are in fact broad concerns that everyone shares. And let me give you one example. I would not be surprised that we start using genetic data, DNA data, to try and make predictions about people's performance in various sports at the highest levels, uh, if that's not already happening. And then you start asking, okay, what do we know about the regime uh, and the regulatory environment around genetic data that we collect from people? It turns out that, and I have, you know, I have a project on this right now. There's very little that is being done right now to regulate the collection, use, and transmission of genetic data and how it's used. And there is a kind of a wild west out there of tools to collect your data, genetic data, very, very personal data, and use it in all kinds of crazy ways without any kind of protections. I imagine that even in the, within the elite group of professional athletes. When this data starts getting used, there's going to be concerns about where this data is being collected, how it's being stored, how it's being used, and for what purpose, and whether those purposes are transparent, and whose interests are being served. Because, again, as far you know, from what I understand, even within the professional sports community, they're the players and they're the owners, and their interests are often not aligned. And so that 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 again is an example of where you know the collection and the control is perhaps with the owners and the businesses and the players would, would want to know exactly how this is being collected and how this is being used. Well, if, if we look ahead, you know, when we were talking about the trajectory of, of technology and some of the pitfalls and challenges that, that experiences, uh, is there something unique that we should you know, concern ourselves with or just recognize that there is something unique about this particular field? I think there are many things about AI that we can predict 
based on how other forms of technology have rolled out. But there are certain there's certain aspects of AI that I think make it harder to talk about and more scary. I think because what we see with AI are systems that seem to look like they behave like people, especially with you know things like chat GPT and other chatbots. We have a strong tendency as humans to, you know, to ascribe human qualities to the objects we interact with. And AI makes it really easy to do that because it looks so plausible. So I think one way in which AI has made conversations a bit trickier is this constant need to correct the anthropomorphizing, this sort of human ascribing human-like qualities to our AI systems that make that change the discussion and make it sound like we're dealing with a real entity when we're not. These are systems we build. They're pieces of code that are very good at imitating us, but are not human. Well, Dr. Venkata of Subramanian, incredible insight. Uh, I certainly personally learned a lot. I know our audience did as well. And, um, you know, it's just incredible what's happening in, in such a relevant and important uh, conversation and topic that we're discussing or discussed today. Uh, so I just want to thank you for taking so much time on short notice to, to appear here on Classes in Session. Thank you very much for having me. Really appreciate it. Artificial intelligence, like any technology, comes with great possibility and great responsibility. It fits like hand and glove in sports, given that sports at the highest level live at the pinnacle, pushing limits of performance with technology as a great partner. AI is now one of those critical partners for success, synthesizing data at faster and faster rates, delivering that data to fit the priorities of a team or an athlete. With so much interdependence on its power, Concerns also arise. Those concerns internally are for the sport to maintain a level playing field. But as sport has the influence to set the tone for policies beyond the court, the best interest of the public comes into focus. This realm has very different standards, requirements, and even laws to uphold. As AI continues its perpetual evolution, we must then be constantly vigilant. It naturally gains ground and machine level understanding that sometimes looks and feels human. So it's up to us to make sure that humanity is never lost in the process. I'm Doug Glanville. See you next time in class.